Hey guys, welcome to part two of our ranking every English monarch in history tier list. Uh, yesterday we did part one and you can find a link to part one on your screen right now. But today we're doing part two and we're picking off, uh, picking up where we left off yesterday with James 6 and 1. Yesterday we ended with Elizabeth I. We got all the way through the Tudor dynasty, did about 550 to 600 years of English history, and today we are going to do the remaining 400 or so. Yesterday's video was just shy of three hours. I'm hoping we can get through today's video in under two. So stay tuned for a longer video. Like I mentioned yesterday, this is the longest single video project that I have ever done. So if you like the video, please do like, share, subscribe. If you find errors in my narration or uh, errors in details that I picked out, feel free to leave them in the comments section below. Uh, let me know what I said out of place or, or things that you found that I should have picked up on in the comments section below. And then, of course, if you do want to support the channel, we do have a Patreon account. But let's get into James 6 and 1. So Elizabeth dies. Elizabeth was the virgin queen. She declared that she would never marry. She declared that she would never have children. And this was mostly in her youth prior to her ascension as queen to keep her safe uh, from her Roman Catholic sister, Mary, Bloody Mary. We talked about her yesterday. Now, Elizabeth reigns for 1, the period of 1558 to 1603, so 45 years, very long time. It's one of the most prosperous eras in English history. And when she dies, she doesn't have any heirs, nor are there any remaining Tudor heirs, really. The closest thing they have to an actual heir is the King of Scotland, James VI. Now, we call him James VI and I because he would become the first James to be King of England. So, he was James VI of Scotland and James I of England. Now, how he comes into the picture is through this family tree here. So, way over on the right side, we have Elizabeth I. And Elizabeth I, as soon as she dies, the only remaining heir to the throne is James 6 and 1. And he is descended from both the kings of Scotland and through the Yorks by way of Henry VIII's sister, Margaret. Henry VII had a daughter called Margaret Tudor, and she was married twice. And James VI and James I uh, was actually descended in both both of these marriages. So Margaret Tudor was first married to James IV, the King of Scotland. They had a child called James V, who would also become King of Scotland, and his daughter, Mary, became the Queen of Scots, Mary Queen of Scots, who was the mother of James I. Now, Margaret Tudor also had a second marriage to a man called Archibald Douglas. They had a daughter named Margaret, who married a guy named Matthew Stewart. They had a son called Henry Stewart. They anglicized the name. And then Henry Stewart ended up having a child with Mary, Queen of Scots. And that child was James 6 and 1. And just for your benefit, I am going to go into full screen right here. Now... During Elizabeth's time, an interesting thing politically happens because Mary, Queen of Scots, is Catholic. She grew up Catholic, maintained her Catholic faith through the Reformation, even when Scotland had their own Reformation and basically started the Presbyterian Church through the Church of Scotland. Mary remained a Roman Catholic, and even through that, she remained very popular in Scotland. So she was both a popular Scotswoman and a popular Catholic. Now, because she was Catholic, as soon as Elizabeth came to the throne, and Mary I, Elizabeth's sister, was now dead, and there were no longer Catholic heirs to the throne, a lot of Catholics in England who were fearful of Elizabeth basically doing to them what Mary I had done to them, they started, or excuse me, what Mary I had done to the Protestants, they turned to Mary, Queen of Scots, as the legitimate heir to the throne as a Catholic because of her descent from the Tudors through Margaret Tudor up here. Now, Mary may have used this to her political advantage, but 
it is also very likely that things were blown out of proportion. And Elizabeth, understanding that there is an air of treason surrounding Mary, Queen of Scots, captures Mary, Queen of Scots, and ends up having her executed when Mary, Queen of Scots, is found guilty of plotting to assassinate Elizabeth I. Now, history is unclear whether or not she actually did play a part in this assassination attempt, but the trial did not go in her favor, and eventually Mary, Queen of Scots, was found guilty of plotting to assassinate Elizabeth for either her own political gain or James's own political gain. So Elizabeth has Mary executed, but in order to make it up to James and not start a civil war in Great Britain between England and Scotland, Elizabeth I basically promises to give the kingdom of England to James as soon as she dies. So James becomes her legal successor. Now, James is an interesting character. He was openly bisexual, which at this time in England was becoming less of an issue. And because of the fact that he grew up in Protestant Scotland and his mother was Catholic, no one really knew where he sat in terms of theology. But he was a very learned person, a very cultural person, and as soon as he took over for Elizabeth I, one of his goals was to continue the idea of Mary England that Elizabeth had handed him. Now, where are we going to put James I on our tier list? I think we can put him at the bottom of B tier. So let's talk a little bit about his reign. As soon as he takes over, the Catholics are happy. Because they weren't necessarily persecuted under Elizabeth, but they've always been worried that their rights are going to be taken away. As soon as Elizabeth takes over, they don't have any rights in Parliament. They don't have any rights to public office. They're not being killed at the stake the way that Protestants were during Mary's years, but they're worried about their rights. And this becomes an issue that actually plagues England for hundreds of years. But in order to fight back against this, they believe that as soon as James takes over, they are going to basically spark a cultural revolution, that the Catholics are going to get their rights back, the Catholics are going to once again retake England. And as soon as James take over, takes over, and it becomes clear that that's not going to happen, he's going to continue every thing that Elizabeth had put in place before him, the Catholics get angry. And in 1605, just two years into his reign, a bunch of Catholics get together, find a guy over in the Netherlands called Guy Fox, and hatch the gunpowder plot. Now what this was, was a group of Catholics get together and essentially pack a whole bunch of gunpowder underneath the House of Lords during the opening of Parliament in November 1605. They want to blow up the government. They want to show that the Catholics are here to fight and things are going to go their way or else. Now, the plot gets discovered. Uh, a whole bunch of people go down for it. They point fingers and eventually, uh, Guy Fox is, of course, hung, hanged, I guess would be the correct term. Um, and... The public, who had been tolerant of Catholics before, really become super intolerant of Catholics, specifically in England. As soon as this terrorist attack happens, Catholics are frowned upon in society. One, uh, Alan Herrera, in his video series that I used as kind of, uh, not my inspiration necessarily, but uh, a lot of um, my source for this video project uh, mentions that it's very similar culturally to the way that Muslims were treated after 9-11, right? So the Catholics plot to blow up parliament. It's not all Catholics, but it's a group of Catholic extremists. And as soon as it happens, even though it doesn't actually happen, as soon as it's discovered, then Catholics become public enemy number one. They no longer have any rights. Nobody wants to have anything to do with Catholics. They make life worse for themselves than it was before. So, part of this societal change that comes with Catholics basically burying themselves in their own graves has to do with Ireland. Now, Ireland, the 
entire island of Ireland has always been historically Catholic, and the English Reformation and the Scottish Reformation doesn't really take hold over in Ireland. And so there's a huge divide culturally between what is essentially Protestant Great Britain and Catholic Ireland. And in order to combat this, James's government, and specifically the government of his sons and successors, start to colonize Northern Ireland with Protestants from Scotland and Protestants from England. This would come to a massive head in the 20th century, but we will talk about that later. So keep that in the back of your mind. They start to colonize Ireland on behalf of the Protestants. Meanwhile, James is a, an interesting kind of controversial figure. So the Catholics were always the ones who were pretty loose on uh, what they expected out of society. They, they got a la uh, away with a lot of liberal ideas and a lot of liberal ways of life. And as soon as they are kind of forced out, then they become extremists on the Protestant side and they call themselves the Puritans. And the Puritans really didn't like James because he was a weird guy. He was very artsy. He was very gay and merry, and he lived life to the fullest in a way they didn't necessarily agree with. Now, at the same time, James was an academic. He was very privately religious. Um, he ended up writing a number of books and a number of religious uh, theses and theolo uh, theological ideas. Um, one of his biggest theological ideas that came to fruition was his King, King James Bible, which was the official English version of the Bible for hundreds of years and still is in a lot of churches, especially in the United States. I don't know if it's the same over in England, but at least in the United States, a large, I shouldn't say majority, but a lot of churches still use the King James Bible. Bible, or the KJV, uh, which started and was, for the most part, written by James himself. I actually have in my library collection a number of his other works. He has a theological uh, disposition on demons and uh, ideas of spirits and how they wrap into theology. Very interesting guy. He wrote pamphlets on tobacco. He hated tobacco. There were a lot of things going on in society that, even though he was very much a liberal person, he had issues with a weird variety of things. And in order to get that point across and try to change society, he would write books and pamphlets and uh, pass them out in public on behalf of his monarchy. Now, he would eventually die in 1625 and the throne would pass on to his son, Charles. Now, I mentioned that James I had issues with the Puritans, and the Puritans had issues with him. Another group of people who had issues with James, and then specifically Charles, uh, were the barons and the lords of England. Now, keep in mind, James, despite having ties to the English throne, grew up his entire life in Scotland. Now, we talked yesterday, in our video yesterday, a lot about this idea of the English electing and choosing their king and having limitations on the power of the king. This wasn't really a thing in Scotland. Scotland had the same historical ideas of anointing a king based on the, the royal tribes or the royal clans in Scotland. But over time, it kind of devolved or evolved whichever way you want to look at it, into a more European concept of monarchy, where the eldest son of the eldest son, or whoever is the rightful heir, gets the throne. They have ultimate power, ultimate say over everything. And James didn't quite grasp that. He understood it, but he didn't want to comply with it. And so most of his reign, he really wanted to push the envelope of the laws that parliament and that the lords were pushing at him and pushed back against it to try to get more power for his monarchy. The same issues come with Charles. Charles also grows up in Scotland. And as soon as he takes the throne in 1625, he pushes the envelope even further than his father did. So where are we going to put Charles I on this list? I'm going to put him... 
Top of D tier, I think I'm going to put him right underneath Richard III above Stephen. Now, whereas James understood the concepts of limitations of power, but didn't want to have those in his face and wanted to exercise full authority over everything, Charles didn't really understand that. He believed that he was the divine authority. He kind of had this concept of kingship the same way that the Egyptians worshipped their pharaohs. He was an incarnation of God on earth, anointed by God. He was the head of the church. He was the head of the country. He was the head of society. He did not want any limitations on his power. Now, a lot of people were really pissed about this. Uh, he really upset the Puritans with the fact that he married a Catholic. He wasn't Catholic himself. The The government would never allow a Catholic to be king necessarily at this point. Um, but he married a Catholic and the Puritans were pissed. Uh, he was already living a lifestyle of wealth and authority that most people didn't agree with on top of the fact that the Puritans didn't agree with uh, the way he was flaunting his wealth, the way that he had certain characters in his court, the fact that he then married a Roman Catholic. And this would all come to a head with what eventually became the Thirty Years' War. So this is a massive war in Central Europe that England became a part of during the Reformation. So there were a whole bunch of political alliances, a whole bunch of theological alliances that tied everybody into what was kind of a precursor to a world war. Uh, it lasted, like it says, for 30 years, um, was fought primarily in the Habsburg monarchy over in Europe. It tied the forces of the Catholic Spanish Empire and the Habsburgs uh, alongside more Protestant territories like Sweden and what was then left of the Holy Roman Empire in Germany. And Charles I basically tells his country, we're going to go off and fight in this war. Now, people were already frustrated with the fact that they had to spend all their money on the king, uh, for the king to spend it away, and they finally put their foot down and said, we need to limit your power. And Charles says, you're not going to do that. And they're like, yeah, we're absolutely going to do that because we're pissed. And he goes, you're not going to do that. You say you're going to do that, but you're not going to do that. And this sparks the English Civil War. Now, there are a lot of civil wars throughout England's history. We talked about at least five of them yesterday. Uh, but when people refer to an English Civil War, it mostly has to do with this. It was a 10-year war between Charles I's royalists and the parliamentarians in England and Wales. So the Puritans in England were supporting Parliament who wanted to limit the power of the king, and they eventually got the army on their side. They kind of bribed the army to come onto their side, and things did not go very well for Charles. It lasts roughly seven years, the first stage of the war. And as soon as the first stage of the war comes to a close, Charles realizes he's not going to win. The parliamentarians are very certain they are going to win. They come together and try to come to terms. This is in 1649. And Charles comes to the table realizes that he's going to lose the war, but at the same time still believes himself to be God's gift to the country. And he will not back down. And they try to offer him terms, and he will not have any of it. He is a dishonest negotiator, and finally, he doesn't realize how much he is tainting his own well. And finally, in January of 1649, they sentence him to death. He doesn't realize how far he has pushed his authority as king. And finally, they cut off his head. He has one son called Charles, well, uh, sorry, two sons, Charles and James, who would go on to become Charles II and James II. But at that point, they have already fled the country. They realize that the country is pissed at the monarchy 
And as soon as Charles I has his head cut off, there is no king in England. So keep in mind, 100 to 150 years later, the exact same thing would happen to a variety of countries across Europe. And it's fascinating that it first happens in England, and what happens because of it in England is different than any other country who has had the exact same thing happen in the world, essentially. So Charles is killed. And over the next 10 years, there's three more years of war between the loyalists and the parliamentarians. And finally, it comes to a successful victory for parliament. Parliament takes over. England is operated as a republic under the rule of parliament. Now, there isn't a clear leader of this parliament. But... Over time, the army realizes that they have the power to then overthrow Parliament. And as soon as the army and the Puritans start disagreeing with the parliamentarians over things like societal laws, over things like the exercising of power, the Puritans and the army then overthrow Parliament itself. And out of this comes what is essentially called the Commonwealth. So the Commonwealth lasted for about 11 years. People also call it the Interregnum or the Protectorate. And what this, what happened during this time was essentially a fake republic in England. England became a republic ruled by the army on behalf of the Puritans. The Puritans were so sick of the Catholics, were so sick of loose Protestants, they wanted to exercise the right of their faith and see society how they want society to actually look. That they institute a military rule in England. And part of this change in society, they take away all public holidays, they take away anything about English society that could be seen as as non-Christian or as paganism. This includes things like Easter and Christmas, which have their roots in pagan holidays. Now, keep in mind, this is something that's happened with the Catholic Church throughout history. They basically take what are previously pagan or non-traditional Christian festivals and institute new belief systems from Christianity into those holidays. So the root of Christmas was in the pagan Yuletide holiday. The Easter holiday was rooted in this new springtime and the equinox of spring. So the Puritans see both of these things and where they're rooted in historically and say, this isn't happening anymore. There are certain foods you can't eat. There are certain ways that you have to live your life now. And the Puritans are in charge. However, the Puritans are a minority a very powerful minority, but the more that their rule goes on, the more pissed society gets. Now, in charge of the army at this time is a gentleman named Oliver Cromwell, and he basically acts as the fake king or the fake ruler of both the army and the Puritans and essentially becomes the king of England between the time that Charles I is executed and then eventually when his son Charles II would come back and claim the throne. So 11 years of this. And the longer it goes on, the more pissed the normal Catholics and Protestants become at the Puritans. Now, as soon as Oliver Cromwell dies in 1658, he is succeeded by his son Richard Cromwell. And as soon as Oliver dies, the public realizes that they have to get rid of society. They see a weak point in the army, they no longer have a clear leader, and they force Richard Cromwell to give up his claim to this fake throne that has been created. And they realize how much they hate republicanism. They realize how much they hate life without a king, and they do something that no other country has ever done after becoming a republic. I shouldn't say any country ever, but they bring back the monarchy. They go and grab Charles I's son, Charles II, and bring him back to England to become the king again. They force Richard Cromwell off the throne, and they bring back Charles II. 
Now, interestingly enough, them bringing back Charles II and reviving Merry England, bringing back public holidays like Easter and Christmas would force the Puritans to go into hiding. First in the Netherlands, and then of course they would go to the Americas. We know them in America as the Pilgrims. So that's the history of the Pilgrims tied up in their backstory. Now Charles II comes to the throne in the year 1660. And where are we going to put Charles II? I am going to keep him also in D tier. I will put him... I'll put him above Richard II. I think that's fair. Charles II, let's put above Richard II. Now, Charles II is brought back to England, and the people are happy having him back, but immediately they put in place limitations to his power. They say, if you're going to be king, you have to follow very strict rules. And he's like, yeah, sure, as long as I don't get my head chopped off the way my dad did, fine. And so he essentially becomes a puppet ruler of a mass populace. For the first time, England is kind of united in being this population that votes what they want, that votes for what they want in power, votes for what laws they want to make, and at the head of this is the figurehead king, Charles. Now, he is as outgoing as his father and his grandfather were. He was uh, an outgoing gentleman. He There was a phrase that he was less of a king and more of a monarch. He was very much this figurehead, very much this happy idol that the people kind of worshipped as a celebrity. He didn't have any real power. Anything that he did uh, or said could be pushed aside as a joke. If people disagreed with it, ah, that's okay. It's just Charles being Charles. Like, it's fine. He didn't have any real power. Now, as soon as he comes to power, one of the first things he actually does with that power is rewrite the history of the last 11 years. His father is sainted as St. Charles in the English church. Uh, they basically rip up everything that had to do with Parliament, everything that had to do with history in the last 11 years. Society pretends like the interregnum never happened. And one thing that helps in this is London burns to the ground. Let me find it here. The Great Fire of London. In 1666, London starts to burn to the ground. Now, it's not really clear how it started. They did end up hanging a guy who claimed that he started the fire, who was actually a suicidal, mentally ill gentleman from France, who wasn't even in the city at the time. But when the city burns to the ground, Charles has a unique opportunity to completely rebuild England, either in his image or the image of the continent, but what actually ends up happening is they rebuild London almost exactly the same way that it was. But instead of having wooden plaster buildings like they had before in the Tudor times, they rebuild it with brick and with stone. And they basically create this new grand city in the image of what it used to be. And so you get this interesting picture of almost a physical representation of what Charles II's monarchy means with the rebuilding of London, right? So they bring back the king, but he has no real power. He doesn't mean anything. It's not a true continuation necessarily in terms of power to what it was before. And when London burns to the ground, they build it back the exact same way, but in a way that's not going to burn to the ground again. Kind of interesting. I don't know if that's irony or what literary device you could use to describe that. However, Charles eventually dies. He rules for 25 years. It's a fairly peaceful time in England. Uh, people kind of start to figure things out in terms of uh, a compliance between Catholics and Protestants. There's still tension, especially in Ireland, but society as a whole starts to kind of heal itself. And then after 25 years on the throne, Charles eventually dies, and he doesn't have any legitimate children. He has a ton of illegitimate children, 
but he doesn't leave a lawful heir. So who takes over his brother, James II, or James 7 and 2? James is a very, very different character than his brother. Kind of in line with their grandfather, James I, James II is kind of an asshole. And he's kind of an idiot. And he doesn't learn the lessons that his brother learned. He doesn't learn the lessons that killed his father. He doesn't learn the lessons that impacted his grandfather. He doesn't understand the idea that he can't be a divine king. His brother's rewriting of history affects James's own outlook on what would then become his throne. Now, this causes problems almost immediately. Where are we going to put James II on this list? I am going to put him in F tier. I'll put him above Edward V. I'll be generous to him. Uh, but James II is going all the way down there in F tier. Now, for one, he was openly Catholic. That caused some problems. The Catholics and the Protestants were starting to get along in England, especially after the Interregnum. But now they had an openly Catholic and an openly Catholic pre uh, preferential king who preferred Catholics and Catholic society. And this caused issues because the majority of people at this time were now Protestants. And so there were huge issues in the southwest of the country, the southwest of England. So Cornwall, Devon, Dorset, Somerset, that area. That area was extremely Puritan. And even after the Puritans were ousted, there were still very religious people in the Southwest. And as soon as James comes to power as an open Catholic, as a preferential Catholic, he goes down there, or rather, rebellions start in the Southwest, and he goes down there, squashes the rebellion, and not only that, but anyone who is found helping those who had rebelled against him are either imprisoned or executed. This causes huge, huge issues in the Southwest. So as soon as that happens, the entire Southwest of the country erupts in what is essentially a minor civil war. He also had massive foreign influence. He was married to Mary of Modena, which is in Italy. So he was very connected to Catholic Europe. This was after uh, Charles I had gotten himself involved in the Civil War, in the Habsburg Civil War in Europe between the Protestants and Catholics in Europe. And he started overreaching his power. One of the first things that he did with power outside of his military exercises was he dissolved Parliament. As soon as Parliaments in both England and Scotland started trying to make laws to limit his power, he shut them both down. This was a massive issue with the House of Lords, and it was starting to look like another English Civil War could be happening less than 100 years after it had already happened, less than 30 years after it had already happened. Now keep in mind, this is not a very long reign. This only happens for three years. He dissolves Parliament. He has two children. And as soon as Parliament gets seriously frustrated with James, they decide they have to do something desperate. Parliament sends a letter of help to the Netherlands. Ruling in the Netherlands is William III, or William of Orange. William of Orange, we'll talk to, or we'll refer to him as right now. William of Orange is married to James's eldest daughter, Mary. And basically, Parliament sends a secret letter to the Netherlands begging William to come and oust James II. They say, we need your help. We need to get him out of here. If you do it successfully will reward you, will pay you, will make your wife queen, help. So William of Orange comes over from the Netherlands and basically forces James out of office. So you essentially get the government of England 
asking a foreign country to invade them to get rid of their king. And that's what happens. The Dutch army, the Dutch navy, come over and force James off the throne. And he has to go into hiding in France. Now, as soon as he leaves, right before Christmas in 1688, the country is once again left without a king. So what happens next? They could declare themselves a republic again, but English society realizes how bad of an idea that was the first time. They don't want it to happen again. They hated having a republic because of what the Puritans did with their society. They can't crown James his rightful heir is his son, James III, or James the Prince of Wales, who was also Catholic. So the only options they have are crowning Mary or crowning William. Now, Mary won't take the throne. She is the rightful Protestant heir to the throne, and she won't take it because of the fact that she believes her husband is superior to her. And William won't take the throne because he didn't come over to become king. He came over to help them get rid of the former king, James II. And so in order to compromise this, what Parliament ends up coming to in an agreement is both of them are going to be king and queen at the same time. Mary is going to run England. William is going to be a figurehead king. But legally, they are both in charge of the country. But Parliament is really in charge. They are essentially just ruling figureheads, filling the place of James II. Now, this is called the Glorious Revolution. So, William III and Mary II take over as ruling dual king and queen of England. This time is typically called the reign of William and Mary. So where are we going to put William and Mary? I think we can rank them together because they reigned essentially... He reigned until 1702, which was eight years more than Mary. Mary only lived for five years. She was very, very sick. So was her sister. We'll get to her sister. Uh, but they were both very sick women. And... William ended up reigning for eight years on his own, but most of his reign was through a regency because he didn't like spending time in England. He wanted to spend his time back in the Netherlands. Where are we going to put William and Mary? Um, let's see here. I think it would be safe to put William and Mary top of B tier. I think we'll put them all the way at the top. So William the third and Mary the second. So we have the glorious revolution. William the third and Mary the second take over, but they don't really have any real power. At this point, Parliament finally comes to terms with what the king and queen are able to do for the country. Because we have tried to allow the king to have power a number of times, and it's never worked. We have tried to limit the power of the king, and it's never worked. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to put the laws in place before we actually crown you. And you're going to have to deal with that. And both of them say, that's fine. Now, during this time, there are repercussions from the previous glorious revolution. We already have the bleeding situations over in Ireland. A civil war in Ireland breaks out. And James II, who goes over to France, now wants to try to get his throne back by way of Ireland and by way of bringing over Catholic troops from France. Now, William, who was a Protestant in the Netherlands, had already had his own issues with the Catholics. There was the Spanish colonization of the Netherlands. There were border battles with France. And so as soon as James II and his son, who would go on to crown himself James III, came over through Ireland, there is a massive civil war in Ireland. Now, England doesn't really get affected, but... As soon as James realizes he's not really going to win any war in Ireland, he tries to jump over through the West Country 
in England, where he has already pissed a lot of people off, uh, having diminished their rebellions previously with the Puritans. And so yet again, James II is unsuccessful in reclaiming the throne. Now, this would lead to his son taking up what would be called the Jacobite claim to the throne, or the Jacobite succession. Um, the name Jacob, or Jacobus, is the Latin term for James. And so when you hear the phrase Jacobite succession, basically they are referring to this idea that the rightful king of England, or king of the United Kingdom, has to be Catholic and has to come through the line of James. And there still is a legal Jacobite pretender living, I think, in France right now. Um, I would have to look up who exactly is. Let's find out. The current Jacobite succession claimants to the thrones of England. Jacobite succession. Currently, it is Franz, the Duke of Bavaria. So he's living in Germany. He is the rightful heir to the Catholic claim in England. Now, all that to say that in England, things are pretty fine during William and Mary's reign. But in all of their other territories, in Ireland, in the West Country of England, in France, in the Netherlands, there is a lot of civil war going on surrounding this concept of Jacobitism. So the Protestants have taken over England, and eventually Mary dies, and eventually William III dies. And taking over from them, the rightful heir to that throne is James II's other daughter, other Protestant child, Anne. And where are we going to put Anne on our list? I think Anne deserves to be bottom of a tier. Now, Anne didn't have necessarily as much power as her sister or her brother-in-law, but what Anne had was a culture behind her, a parliament that did a lot during her reign, and she understood her role, and society flourished during Anne's time. She was married uh, to a Lutheran in Germany called Prince George of Denmark and Norway. So I shouldn't say he was German. I mean, he was German, but he was the king of Denmark and Norway. Or rather, the prince of Denmark and Norway. When Anne took over, Parliament asked if she wanted to basically do the exact same double ruling thing that her sister and brother-in-law had done. And she said, absolutely not. I don't want my husband anywhere near England. And Parliament went, that's fair. So Anne ruled by herself. This was the first time, really, that a, queen, a married queen ruled England without any outside influence from her spouse. She basically abandoned her husband and came over to England on her own. Ruled for 12 years. Like I mentioned earlier, she was a very sickly woman. She had a number of pregnancies trying to give birth to a legitimate heir to the Protestant or the Anglican succession of the throne. And it never came to fruition. She had 17 pregnancies. Only one of them really survived into his youth. And that was Prince William, the Duke of Gloucester, who died when he was 11. So, during Anne's time, an interesting thing happens. In the year 1707, the countries of England and Scotland are finally legitimately united as no longer two separate countries, but come together as Great Britain. And for the next hundred years, just shy of a hundred years, this is when we get the country of Great Britain. So what would go on to be the American Revolution fighting against Great Britain, this started and sparked during her reign. Now, apart from her marriage and everything that was going on politically in England, one thing that she became very prominent for within the culture was this idea of grandeur. So when we think of the 
king or queen of England today in this very ceremonial role. I've mentioned in the in yesterday's video uh, that there are a number of kings who kind of became this ceremonial figurehead. But all of the roots of the modern monarchy having this idea of celebrity and grandeur and palaces and, and not just being rulers or battle leaders or medieval kings, the idea of a modern European monarch really kind of started with Anne. She was the person that all of the people wanted to look up to, wanted to dress like, wanted to see in person. All of the things that we kind of consider with like someone like Elizabeth II or even uh, to a, I suppose, greater celebrity extent, William and Kate, that kind of started with Anne. Now, she understood there were limitations on her power, but she played a massive role in Parliament's idea of celebrity and ceremonialism in getting people to support the military abroad by using Anne as a figurehead. Now, this is something that would really come to fruition during Victoria's time, and we'll talk about Victoria when we get her, but that concept of using the queen as a figurehead for the country in order to get moral support behind the empire came with Anne. Now, 17 pregnancies, no heirs. And here is where we sit with the succession. They're not going to give the country back to the Jacobites. They do not want the Catholics in charge of the country. So the only Protestant left in line has absolutely nothing to do with the Stuarts. I mean, it kind of has something to do with the Stuarts. But here's where we were sitting with the family tree, right? You get James I, Charles I, Charles II and his brother James, and James has children Mary the second and Anne. Anne dies. Prince William is also dead. There are no claimants to the throne except for James the third, who is Catholic. So in order to find a legitimate Protestant heir, we have to go all the way back up to James the first. And James the first, apart from having a son, Charles the first, also had a daughter called Elizabeth, who was married off to the King of Bohemia. They had a daughter called Sophia of Hanover. Now, right as Anne is coming to her deathbed, Sophia knows that she is the legitimate heir to the throne, and she really wants it. But at this time, Anne is 49 years old, and Sophia is, sorry, I didn't actually look at the day that she died, 1714. Uh, Sophia is... 83. And all she has to do is live longer than Anne, and she becomes the new Queen of England. And Anne gets this idea that Sophia is going to try to kill Anne, to poison Anne, to somehow get Anne off of the throne before Anne dies, to put herself on the throne before she herself dies. And as soon as Anne calls Sophia out for this, whether or not it's true, Sophia basically has a heart attack because she's so embarrassed. And so she dies age 83 on June 8th. And Anne dies on August 1st. So less than two months later. However, Sophia has a son with the elector of Hanover called George. Now, George is super German, egregiously German. For the first time in English history, they now have a German king. They had just had the Scottish House of Stuart. They had had the Welsh House of Tudor. And all of the kings before that were either French or Danish, uh, leading back to 1066. But now the Germans are in charge. George grows up in Germany. And he has a very unique backstory in terms of his adult life before he becomes the king. So he was born in 1660. He takes over in 1714 at age 54. So he is already a middle-aged to getting to become an elderly man by the time he takes the throne. 
and the English get word of a story that happened while he is Prince Elector of Hanover. Or rather, Elector of Hanover. And this centers around his wife, Sophia Dorothea of Sella. Now, she was another princess from one of the areas of Germany at this time. Before Germany was a united country, it had a bunch of different duchies and principalities, and it was a very divided country with a whole bunch of different vassal states. And they hate each other as soon as they're married, to the point where she starts having an affair with a gentleman called Count Philip Christoph von Königsmach. And as soon as George finds out about this affair, Königsmark disappears. And Sophia is imprisoned and basically never sees the light of day again. She's not killed, but is imprisoned in the castle at Alden for the rest of her life. Now, this not only pisses off the English when they find out about it, but it pisses off George's son, who would go on to become George II. And one thing that you'll notice about the House of Hanover is the fathers and sons absolutely hate each other. And this will come to a head with George III and George IV. But George I, uh, George I comes over to Great Britain to become the first crowned king of Great Britain, right? Anne was queen of Great Britain, but that happened during her time. So he becomes the first king crowned during the united Great Britain as a country. He doesn't speak a word of English. He has no idea how to speak English. This is probably the worst linguistic divide since probably the Norman Conquest. And so he has absolutely no power. All of his words at his coronation and his oaths are read out by an associate. He doesn't really know how to communicate with Parliament. Uh, the Prime Minister or, or his ministers at large basically spoke to him in Latin. And neither of them spoke Latin very well. So he had very little communication with the people who were actually in charge of the country. He had very little actual power himself. Where should we put George the I? I am going to put George the I at the very top of F tier. Like I said, he had no power. Things were decent in England at the time, but there was really nothing to his reign. He only ruled for 13 years, and during this time, everything was essentially run through a gentleman called Robert Walpole, who acted as what was essentially Britain's first prime minister, the first person who was in charge of the country uh, without being the king and having all power given to him elected through parliament. Now, what else happened during George I's years? James III, who was the Jacobite pretender, continued his wars of Jacobite rebellions. And then as soon as... James III dies, then a gentleman called Charles III takes over that claim as well. So most of George's reign is having to do with the Jacobite rebellions and solidifying his claim as King of England. But at this point, like I said, he has no power and the country is ruled by a Protestant authority and the people are absolutely fine with it. But he doesn't do anything. I'm putting him in F tier. And eventually, his son takes over after his death. Now, like I mentioned, he and his son hated each other. Most of that was rooted in the fact that his mother was imprisoned by his father. A whole bunch of other reasons, but that was where it was rooted in. Now, George II understood English culture a little better. He was still super German, spoke very little English, but still understood it, understood English its people. Where am I going to put George II? I think we can put George II in D tier. I'm going to put him right below Charles I. So George II right under Charles I. A lot of D tier kings here. But as soon as George II takes over, he then has a celebrity feud with his own son. And this is rooted in 
their interpretations of culture. George II was a very proper, very conservative king. He understood the conservative ideas of English society, whereas his son very much understood the liberal sides of English culture. And this played out in a very unique way. They had their own courts separate from each other, and they basically battled out to see who could one-up the other person in a celebrity feud. George II would go see Handel. George III, or his son, excuse me, no, his son Frederick, uh, would go on to local plays. And they would make fun of each other in the tabloids. And this became essentially the first noteworthy account of a celebrity feud between the royal family. And that's all they really were. They weren't, they didn't have a lot of legitimate power. They still followed along in the footsteps of George I, where the country was run by the prime minister and the parliament, but there wasn't really anything to the legitimacy of power with George II. However, there was an instance with the Seven Years' War that went on in Europe. Now, the Seven Years' War is something that we do talk about in American history because rooted in the Seven Years' War is what would go on to become the French and Indian War in the United States, which was kind of a proxy war as part of the Seven Years' War in Europe. So the European continent erupted in another one of these precursors to a world war. It wasn't the First World War, but it was very similar in its scope and what was going on with the countries at the time. So Britain was at war during the War of the Austrian Succession, uh, and the entire continent goes to war, and this affects the Americas. Now, George II becomes the last British king to lead his troops into battle, and it kind of happened by happenstance. But when George II does this, he legitimizes his throne more than Parliament would have liked. In George II riding into battle with troops in kind of what was a showpiece, he is giving himself legitimacy as a ruler. And the military really likes him, and people start to really like him. And slowly, the power vacuum that was centered toward Parliament is now starting to slip back slightly with George II. Now, he had a number of affairs, and this affected his relationship with his son, Frederick, but he lives a very long time. He dies at age 76, and by that time, Frederick had already died. So, taking his place as king is George III, the American king. And where are we going to put George III? Um, I'm actually going to put George III above Henry II in C tier for a variety of reasons. So we talk about George III, uh, George III, and George III is the king that everyone in America would probably know best with American history. He is the king responsible for the American Revolution. Now, it's a bit more complicated than him just being tyrannical. Now... Over the last however many hundred years, 400 years or so, there had not been an instance of the king being crazy. However, it starts to come about halfway through George III's life. George III starts very popular. People really like him. They liked his dad. They like him as well. Early in his reign, the Seven Years' War happens, like I mentioned, and after the Seven Years' War, England, for the very first time, emerges as the most powerful kingdom in England. The British Empire slowly emerges as the leading world power, and this really didn't happen until George III's reign. Now, England had owned France before and had been a major player on the continent, but typically Germany, Italy, Spain, the Catholic powers had dominated world affairs in comparison to what England and what Great Britain were able to do. But now, 
having massive amounts of territory in the Americas, having amounts of territory in Africa and Australia and Asia. George III is really where the British Empire starts to boom. During his reign, at the same time that the British Empire is expanding, the Industrial Revolution is also happening as well. And George III was very much a contributor uh, politically and monetarily to the expansion of, revolution, uh, of Industrial Revolution, both in machinery and agriculture. He realizes that this is highly beneficial to the people who own farms and who own the machineries and who own the factories. And if you want to blame anybody for capitalism getting to the max, you could probably blame George III because he was very much behind propelling this into the public eye. But things really start to fall apart when he begins overstepping his power. He was a very intelligent man. And as soon as he realizes how much power he actually has, given the fact that the British Empire is now where it is in the world stage, he starts intimidating Parliament. He starts making friends with politicians, and he starts trying to weasel his way into Parliament to try to influence things in his own favor. This wasn't just an issue in the Americas. He did it in England. He did it in Great Britain as a whole. He wanted as much influence in politics as he could because he believed he was smart enough to deal with it and to give the right answers. Now, this really starts to bother the politicians. For the first time in however many kings, they were once again having a king who was overstepping his bounds. And this is when it comes to the American Revolution. So, as soon as he starts overstepping his bounds with Parliament, Parliament steps on his toes and says, you need to take a step back. Now, during this time, he starts to go a little crazy. And Parliament is running out of money because the British Empire is expanding faster than it can support its own uh, economic... What's the word I'm looking for? Validity? It is expanding faster than it is, is able to support itself. And so in order to bring in the money to fund this and fund the expansion of the British Empire, he starts to tax his own people. And this immediately goes wrong. The people say, we're not going to do it. George realizes that he took a step out of bounds. And he goes, okay, we can't do it to the British people. Who can we do it to? And he sees the Americans. And so he starts to tax the Americans because he knows that the Americans don't have the ability to fight back politically and threaten him necessarily the way that the British people do on the island. And so as soon as he starts pushing taxes and tariffs at the American colonists, things start to backfire. And it's at this point that when he starts to go mad, the people in the Americas realize we actually have a legitimate claim to overthrow a king. Yada, 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 American Revolution. The Americans win, and Great Britain is forced at the Treaty of... Oh, which treaty ended the Revolutionary War? I am failing 8th grade history right now. Uh... Treaty of um, Revolutionary War was ended with the Treaty of Third Grade Me would be just laughing right now. Uh, ended at the Treaty of Paris. Oh, that was a lot easier than I thought it was going to be. Um, so, anyways, at the Treaty of Paris. George III officially has to give up his rights and proclaim the United States as an independent country. He doesn't want to, and he is going to fight back against this with everything he can, but his overstepping of parliament, his overtaxation of his own people leading to the overtaxation of the American people, sparks something 
that he doesn't quite realize he's sparking. The Treaty of Paris happens, and within 15 years, his hosts in France are being overthrown as well. And all across Europe, people are overthrowing their kings because they see kings overstepping the bounds of what parliament should be allowing them to do. And at the same time that this is going on, he is suffering from potential bipolar disorder. Uh, he is suffering from blood poisoning. He is suffering from massive mental illness, probably rooted in Catherine de Valois that we talked about last episode. So he is still ruling and reigning, and he is getting into his 60s, but his madness takes over. And his son, who he hates and has had a massive feud his entire life with, basically has to take over the country. And this is where we get to a gentleman called George IV, who you probably know from the thumbnail. George IV, we are going to put in F tier, and we're going to put him right below Henry III. Now, if George III never learned from his mistakes in trying to overstep his power, then George IV really didn't understand overstepping his bounds. Now, one thing that George IV had in his favor is that as soon as George III is no longer able to reign, but is still legally the king, then George can start making decisions on behalf of his father but blaming his father for all the mistakes that he makes in these decisions. So he rules as regent for over nine years, during which time he and his father physically fight nearly all of the time. He basically imprisons his own father and tries to have him tortured to death. They try to cut the blood out of him. They try to suppress him and suffocate him. And George IV tries to torture his father to death. And eventually, George III finally dies. And at the time that he died, he was, what did it say, 81 years old, the longest reigning king that England or Great Britain had ever had. And finally, George IV is actually in legitimate power. Now, as soon as he takes over, a wild Republican movement, movement takes over in England. Obviously, you see things with the American Revolution. You see things with the French Revolution. You would see various revolutions across the European continent basically demanding kings to step down and Republicanism taking over. Now, keep in mind, England has already had a number of civil wars, and they have experimented within the last 200 years with not having a king. And it didn't go very well, and that memory is still fresh in the minds of society. Even though it was nearly 200 years ago, they remember the horror stories that came from the interregnum. So they don't necessarily want to get rid of their king, but the Republican movement is really, really moving in an upward direction. And in order to fix this, George IV employs a man called William Pitt. And William Pitt is his prime minister who he basically employs to destroy the Republican movement. And this leads to William Pitt going around and imprisoning people for treason, for talking ill against the king, for making fun of the king. George IV was a really fat gentleman. And you can kind of see it with this picture, but the robes are so big that it helps hide how fat he was. And he was very insecure about his look, and he was very insecure about what people thought of him. So if anyone were found to be making fun of the king, whether it be in the things that he said, or the things that he implemented, or the way that he looked, they would be imprisoned by William Pitt. And he used William Pitt to try to take away the pressure from himself and, and make it seem like he wasn't the one calling for the heads of his subjects. Now, at the same time, Catholics are fighting for their rights again. The Jacobite succession is no longer in a legitimate swing. There isn't really a threat to George's power from the Catholics, 
But the Catholics want civil rights. The Catholics have not had civil rights since the time of Mary. They aren't allowed to hold certain positions. They aren't allowed to serve in parliament. And they basically demand George to give them rights. And he does not want anything to do with it. Now, at this time, uh, right after the regents, or right before the regency, rather, uh, the United Kingdom was formed by Great Britain essentially taking over Ireland completely, bringing it into one country, the same way England had done with Scotland. Now, Great Britain was doing with Ireland, and this created the United Kingdom. And so having all of these people under the same roof, especially a massive majority of Catholics in Ireland, Catholic rights were a serious topic of debate. And George IV wanted nothing to do with it. He really wanted nothing to do with ruling apart from keeping his image clean. He had a number of affairs with women similar to his great-grandfather, uh, George II. He was very, very unpopular with the people for a variety of reasons. Now, he didn't have any legitimate children except for Charlotte of Wales, who was not going to ascend to the throne because there were other male heirs to the throne. And eventually, George IV dies. Now, around the time of his death, interesting things are happening across the continent. Apart from just Republican movements, at the same time that Republican movements are sweeping the continent, Napoleon is taking over in Europe. And George IV is seriously worried about the power of not only himself, but the future of the kingship because of Napoleon. And when he dies, he is succeeded by his younger brother, William. Where are we going to put William IV? I think we can put William right under Mary the First. I'll put him in C tier. So William takes over during a time when the monarchy is in serious jeopardy. Like I said, the Republican movement was moving up. His brother wanted nothing to do with implementing Catholic rights. The Catholics were seriously upset with the populace, especially now that Ireland had a say in English affairs. The continent was being swept up in the Napoleonic Wars. So what does William do to try to fix this? Because he knows if he doesn't do something about it, the monarchy is going to collapse on itself yet again. And he doesn't want to be the one responsible for it. Even though his brother was very much responsible for the, the situations arising, and his father was very much responsible for the situation that arose, he doesn't want to be the king that it all fell apart on. And so the first thing he does is seriously strip back the financials of the monarchy. His brother had a very large court, was very, very pompous and expensive with the things that he was spending his money on, was very grand with the way he did things. And even though you see a proper portrait of William IV here, his gown in comparison to his brother's is significantly stripped back. And so William takes money away from the monarchy and doesn't necessarily give it back to the people, but reinstitutes it within the country to better support the British Empire. And people like this. People like that the king is no longer taking as much of their money. He starts a democratic reform. All of these new towns that are emerging with his father's industrial revolution, he realizes that he could help the monarchy by supporting public affairs in these new areas. And in order to get the common folk behind the monarchy, he establishes the roots of what would then become the House of Commons. So he gives common folk the right to representation in Parliament. No longer is it just ruled by the House of Lords, but he establishes representation for all of these new towns through members of Parliament, and that also becomes very popular. He also has a hand in what is called the 
aristocratic revolution. He basically saw all of these barons and lords throughout the country who were spending massive amounts of wealth, who still had power over the subjects living on their land, and he wants to diminish that. He wants to squash that. He basically takes away the rights of a massive amount of aristocrats in England. And the common folk are very grateful for this. Now, he doesn't really free them from their feudal lords. He doesn't really give them the money back that the feudal lords were taking from their subjects. But they're happy to be free in just name. I... He, he does what he can to appease as, most, as, as many people as possible. And so, in his very short reign, he ruled just short of seven years. William IV does more to save the monarchy than almost any king in history. Now, why don't I have him higher than C tier? I think part of it is to do with how short his reign was, but mostly because a lot of what he tried to implement as king would be really brought to the forefront of his successor's reign. A lot of what he started was finished and concluded with his niece. Now that brings us to his niece, Victoria. Her uncle, William IV, dies and the monarchy is still on shaky ground. Despite everything William IV did for it, he was only there for seven years. The Republican movement is still strong. The idea of the Napoleonic Wars is still strong in Europe. The monarchy is on shaky ground. And all of a sudden, this no-name girl from out of nowhere comes to the forefront. How does she come to the throne? If we see her family tree here, uh, this looks a little different than the ones that we had looked at before. So, um, her father was Edward, who was a younger son of George III. So, when George IV dies without children, it passes to his brother, William IV. When William IV dies, it passes to his brother, Edward. Problem is, Edward's dead. So, the rightful heir to the throne is Edward's daughter, Victoria. Now, Victoria was raised in a very unique household. Uh, her father died when she was very young, and she was raised by her mother, also named Victoria, who was from Saxe-Coburg and Saalfield in Germany. Now, her mother hated England, or more specifically, hated the English royal family. She thought it was a joke. She thought it was a bunch of celebrities living to embarrass each other, and to the point that she worried for her daughter's safety to the point that she raised her daughter basically locked up in Kensington Palace for her entire childhood. And as soon as her daughter then becomes queen, Victoria the Younger, Queen Victoria, said to her mother, screw off, this is my life, I'm going to do what I want. And almost immediately, Victoria marries the most attractive man she has seen in her entire life, her first cousin, Prince Albert. Three years into her reign, she marries her cousin Albert of Saxe-Coburg and Gotha, who is also from Germany. And he grows up in Germany. So we come to Victoria. Where are we going to put her? I think it's... I think she has to be S here. I mean, she's she is one of the figures of English history that you can't have English history without. And so let's talk a little bit about her reign. We talked about her upbringing and her marriage, but... Prince Albert was a controversial figure. Because he was so German and so tied to the German Empire with his family and with his political affiliations, Parliament was not going to allow Queen Victoria to let Albert rule as king. She was the heir to the throne. He was a German nobody. And finally, they consent to giving him the title of Prince Consort. So he has legitimately no power in England. However, Victoria, very much like Mary II, wasn't going to be satisfied with this. So she allows Albert to basically run the country from his position as Prince Consort and do it in her name. So Albert kind of operates as a regent or a king of England 
through his wife, Victoria. And through him comes a massive wave of modernization in England. An industrial revolution had been sparked by George III, but things really blew up machinery-wise in Germany. And Albert grows up with this, and he comes to England and realizes we could make a lot of money here if we bring a proper mechanical revolution to England. So in order to pitch this, and in order to get this off without a hitch, he comes up with the Great Exhibition of 1851, what is essentially England's first World's Fair. He builds this massive crystal glass palace and displays from around the world works of art and industry. Kind of the first World's Fair. And as soon as this happens, and it is massively successful, you get exhibitions from Charles Darwin, Karl Marx, Michael Faraday, Samuel Colt, uh, members of the Orléans royal family, Charlotte Bronte, Charles Dickens, Lewis Carroll, George Eliot. This is massively successful, both economically and for the culture of Victorian England. If you want to think about the era of Victorian England and think about where this kind of cultural revolution sparked, a lot of it can be rooted to the Great Exhibition. This is massively successful. Now, Parliament still doesn't like Albert and really doesn't like Albert even more because of the fact that he has done this. He has shown off what he is able to do with a little bit of power, and they become very skeptical of him. However, the public starts to really like Albert and Victoria. And in just a few years, this idea that the th the throne should be taken over... Uh, the queen should be kicked off the throne and republicanism should take over once again. It's no longer there because of how popular Albert and Victoria become. Now, 10 years later, Albert dies. He's only 42 years old when he dies and Victoria takes this hard. And as soon as Albert dies, her popularity starts to diminish just slightly. But at the same time, Victoria starts to exercise a little bit of her own power. Now, Parliament has always been very, very careful with giving monarchs power. But Victoria kind of skirts around this in an interesting way. One thing that happened was there was a parliamentary election where a party that had not had power in Great Britain before took over and Queen Victoria realized that this could affect certain aspects of her life, whether it be the money or where she was spending her money, whether it be who she could have in her court. And she basically became such an annoyance to this new government that they resigned. So Victoria uses her abilities as queen and in a way annoys Parliament to get what she wants. She uses a new political power that she's never had before and gets Parliament to do the things that she wants by basically just being a thorn in their side. Now, she would go on to have a number of kids with Albert already, and as soon as they are grown, she uses her children as political chess pieces. Let's take a look at her issue. She has, her eldest is a girl called Victoria, who is married off to Crown Prince Frederick of the German Empire. At this point, Germany was starting to unify into an empire. So her eldest daughter becomes the Queen Empress of Prussia, of Germany. Then she has another son who is the heir to the throne. So he can't be married off to a foreign country but marries Alexander of Denmark. This wraps the Danish family into the picture. She has a daughter called Prince Alice, who is married off to Prince Louis, the Grand Duke of Hesse and the Rhine, which is a prince in Germany. She has a son called Alfred, who takes over the Duchy of Saxe-Coburg and Gotha in Germany, who marries 
Duchess Marie Alexandrovna of Russia, which ties the Russian royal family into the picture. She's a daughter called Princess Helena, who marries Prince Christian of Schleswig-Holstein, which we will get to later on. They come back up. She has a daughter called Princess Louisa, who marries John Campbell, the Marquess of Lorne, who is a British nobleman and eventually brings the Canadian picture into the fold. She has a son called Prince Arthur, who becomes Duke of Connaught and Strathern, who marries Princess Louise Margaret of Prussia, which reties in the Prussian royal family. Prince Leopold, the Duke of Albany, marries Princess Helena of Waldeck and Piermont. And then Princess Beatrice, her youngest daughter, marries Henry of Battenberg. This family will also come back up later. So, eventually, these children give birth to grandchildren, which consist of families in the United Kingdom, royal families in Germany, in the Duchy of Hesse, in Saxe Coburg and Gotha, in Russia, in Norway, in Greece, in Spain, and in Romania. All of them politically and genetically linked to Queen Victoria. And they still are today, by the way. Now, there was still an active Republican movement going on. And in order to fight back against this, all of a sudden, coming to power is Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli. And Disraeli is very important to talk about during Victoria's reign because everything we think about with Victoria, her being this image, the grandmother of the United Kingdom, all of that is rooted in the ideas of Benjamin Disraeli. And I don't see him on the front here, so let's just look up Benjamin Disraeli. He was Prime Minister of the United Kingdom from 1874 to 1880. He was born to a Jewish family eventually converted to Christianity, uh, but was kind of the, the father figure of the modern British Conservative Party. During his time as Prime Minister, it was becoming more and more difficult for the British Empire to expand and continue to support itself with how big it was. At this time, if we look up the British Empire during Victoria, Victorian era. We should be able to find a map of the British Empire during what is essentially its largest point. And they not only don't have the money to support it, but they also don't necessarily have the public support behind it. Now, ignore the 13 colonies here, but essentially, if you ignore America, this map shows what would go on to become the British Empire during Victoria's time. It covered nearly a quarter of the world, which costs a lot of money, and a lot of that money had to go through London. So Benjamin Disraeli gets this idea in his head that in order to get people behind paying more taxes to the British government, He's going to make Victoria the figurehead of the empire. And he does this in a variety of ways. He puts her face on the postage stamp. He puts her face on the money. He puts her face on statues that they erect in cities all over the empire. They make Victoria's name known. They make Victoria Park. They make Victoria Square. They name cities after Victoria. They name states in Australia after Victoria. Victoria becomes this grandmother figure, almost a godly figure, where everyone in the empire looks towards as the person they are supporting. And people, I shouldn't say fall for it, but essentially fall for it. And people start paying more in taxes and people start worshipping Victoria as the matronly figure that she was. And by the time Victoria dies, the British Empire is nearly at the strongest point it's ever been. Her connections politically in Europe make her wildly popular with other European royal families because she is the grandmother of a lot of prince regents and or, or heirs to the thrones of foreign countries. And she finally dies 
in 1901, bringing us into the 20th century. And she is succeeded by her second child, her eldest son, Edward VII. Where are we going to put Edward VII? I think it's safe to put Edward VII middle of C tier. We'll put him right below William IV. So, Edward VII. Oh, we forgot to rank Edward VI. We'll come back to that. Edward VII, I am going to put right below William IV. Let me pause and find Edward the Sixth real quick. I have him right below John. Okay, Edward the Seventh. He is a bit of a maverick. He grows up in an interesting home. His mother ignores him. His father ignores him. And much like many ignored children, he finds people to appreciate him or goes off to find love in other places. And he's a bit of a liberal. And in his adolescence, he is he becomes the first known heir to the throne to visit a brothel and get caught. And his mother and his father are pissed. And this is kind of the story of his life. He does things to make his parents upset. One of the things that was very controversial with him and would go on to be controversial during his reign is his relationship with minorities. He had friends who were Jewish. He had friends who were Catholics. He had friends who were Muslims. He was very much anti-racist. He wanted everyone in the British Empire to feel the way that he thought the common British people did about their society. He was offended by racism across the British Empire. He wanted to be a champion for change. He would have fit very well in our modern times, except for the fact that he kind of hated women uh, and was super against women's suffrage. But Edward VII... was very much tied up in the concepts of women's suffrage and his relationship with Germany. He hated his nephew. His nephew was the Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm II, and the two absolutely did not get along. He thought Wilhelm's ideas of the world were completely backwards. He thought that Wilhelm was bringing shame to uh the family, and they had a very poor relationship that would eventually lead to him making alliances with other countries, basically to spite his nephew. He only reigns for nine years, and that's why I have him where I have him. Nothing really happens. He kind of continues the success of his mother's reign. Um, Australia and Canada start to kind of govern themselves during this range. There were a few minor skirmishes, but not a lot of happened during his time, except for some starts of political revolutions across Europe, most specifically the rise of socialism. But his policies and the, thing that, the things that he does with Parliament kind of start to introduce us to World War I. He dies, he is succeeded by his son, George V. Where are we going to put George V? I think it's safe to put George V in B tier. I'm going to put him right underneath Edward III. George V right under Edward III. Now, George V is a very, very popular figure in English history. Um, he was the king that led England or rather the United Kingdom, I, I, I have probably been using the phrases interchangeably. Um, at this point, we are well into the United Kingdom era. Uh, but George becomes the figurehead of the United Kingdom during World War I. He has a better relationship with the Kaiser than his father did. He is a cousin of the Kaiser rather than a, an uncle of the Kaiser. Um, he is cousins with basically all of the royals across Europe, whether it be in Germany, in Russia, uh, in Greece, in Spain, in all of these places around the United or in, around Europe, he has ties to. And World War I is tough on him personally because of the fact that all of the countries that his relatives 
are reigning, he has to fight against, or he has to send his people off to fight against. Now, during this reign, or rather during his upbringing, he was never expected to be king. He was actually the second son of Edward and Edward's wife, but his brother died. His brother was killed in battle during, or actually, I'm trying to remember how he died. Let's see here. His death, did he die of, oh, he died of an influenza during 1892. So he never expected to be king, but eventually it was placed on him to be king. And he did a very good job. He was married to a cousin of his called Mary of Tech, who was actually supposed to be married to his brother and ended up marrying him after his brother's death. The two would go on to become one of the power duos of the royal family's history, if that is a term we can use in this video. Um, but during World War I, a variety of things start happening across Europe. Let's start in England. Most importantly, in England, the fact that George V is of the family of Saxe, Coburg, and Gotha is controversial. The fact that he's cousins with the Kaiser is controversial because he is the British king sending his troops to fight the Germans. But at the same time, he has massive ties to the Germans. So why are they fighting for a German king? One of the first things he does when he gets in office uh, is change the name of the royal family from the house of Saxe, Coburg, and Gotha to the house of Windsor, which it still is today. So it's still the same family. The family is still German in its roots, but they changed the name to make it more English. Public perception was a massive concept uh, that came to fruition during George V's time. As soon as World War I kind of comes to a close, he has another issue going on with his favorite cousin and actually twin, Tsar Nicholas II. The two are very similar to the point where if you look up pictures of George, George, George the Fifth and Nicholas II, there are pictures where they look nearly identical. To the point where it's scary. This one, most of all, scares me the most. Wait till it pops up on screen here. Give it a sec. There we go. The two were virtually twins. They are cousins. And the two had a very close relationship. Now, here's what happens if you know anything about Russian history. At the end of World War I, the Russians back out of the war because they are having their own revolution rooted in socialism. Eventually, a whole bunch of parties fight against each other for the right to reign. And during this scuffle, the Russian royal family is imprisoned and it are eventually executed. Now, right before they're executed, Tsar Nicholas II sends a letter of help to George V and says, please allow us to take refuge in your country. And the prime minister is all for it. But George V is worried because he has already seen his cousin Sar uh, Kaiser Wilhelm deposed in Germany. He sees socialist revolution across Europe. He sees it happening in England itself. And he's worried that if he brings Nicholas over to England, then the people are going to revolt against him for supporting who the socialists see as a tyrant. And so George V denies Nicholas refuge in England, and Nicholas and his family are slaughtered. And this haunts George V for the rest of his life. Now, at the same time that this is going on, there is another Irish revolution happening, of course, in Ireland. The concepts of Irish nationalism were starting to spark with socialist revolutions. The Catholics were still not having the civil rights that they wanted 
in Parliament, despite the fact that Benjamin Disraeli, who was a Jewish-born prime minister, had already been prime minister Catholic, still didn't have the specific right to hold office across the United Kingdom. And so the Irish Free State emerges as the ruling power in Ireland, but at the same time, there are all of these Ulster colonists up in Northern Ireland who have been there for hundreds of years. They're all Protestants and all of them are loyal to the royal family or to the Protestant side of the United Kingdom. And this sparks the first of the Irish civil wars. The, not the first of the Irish civil wars, but what we know as the start of the bloody Ireland wars that would affect Ireland into the 1990s. So that happens... And at the same time, the British Empire is still running out of money. And one thing they do to help this is taking advantage of all of the depositions of the royal families across Europe. Now, keep in mind, George V is related to all of these families. The Russians, the Germans, all of them. He is usually a first cousin, sometimes a first cousin once removed, sometimes a second cousin to all of these royals. And as soon as they're deposed... One thing that disappears, apart from the royals of these countries, is their wealth and their jewels. And somewhat suspiciously, all of these jewels end up in England. More specifically, in the hands of his wife, Mary of Teck. And Mary of Teck uses the wealth that they are somehow getting from all of these foreign countries to continue to support the monarchy. Now, George V realized that they, in bringing all of these precious jewels across to England, were making themselves wealthier than they needed to, uh, how do I word it? They were bringing in their own wealth more than they needed to support the wealth that they had been losing. And so, to keep his public image high, he basically says, we don't need the public taxes as much as we used to, and starts to cut his own funds, very similar to what William IV had done. So the public starts paying less taxes to the continuation of the monarchy, and this makes George V and Mary of Tech, his wife, more popular. Now, there is also a massive recession going on at the same time. He rules from 1910 to 1936, and in 1929, a global recession, the Great Depression, starts. This affects England massively. And he starts to get involved with the politics of the country. For the first time, Parliament is okay with the king allowing with the king helping out Parliament because Parliament is at a loss with what to do. An interesting case happens where in 1924, the Labour Party is elected for the first time. And as soon as the Great Depression starts, the Labour Party wants or realizes that they have to resign. They have to give up their government because they have failed as a ruling government. And George V notices something interesting about the political landscape in the country. Now, for years, the Conservative Party, and, and most people would say it's still this way today in England, but the Conservative Party was kind of seen as this good boys club. It's all of the rich people in Parliament. It's all of the people with wealth getting daddy's money to support their political campaigns. So... George V realizes that if the Labour government resigns and the Conservative Party takes over during this Great Depression and they're not able to make any changes, then the people are going to revolt against the Good Boys Club because the Good Boys Club is ridding the poor people of even more of the money they don't have. So George V realizes that the only thing to save the country from a potential civil war or a or another peasants uprising essentially is to keep the labor party in charge because they are the populist lower class party he forces the labor party to stay in charge and essentially uses the conservative government as a puppet government behind the scenes to fix the problems of the Labour Party under the rule of George himself he becomes what is essentially the last 
British king to exercise power of government over the government itself. The last real ruling king of England. Now, eventually he dies in 1936. And he has two sons. He has a lot more than two sons, but two sons that we need to talk about. He has one elder son called David, and he has a younger son called Albert. Let's talk about David. David eventually becomes Edward VIII. And where are we going to put Edward VIII? I am going to put him D tier. I'm really tempted to put him in F tier. I don't like Edward VIII. If you do, that's your own problem. I don't have much sympathy for Edward VIII. But let's talk about him. I'm going to put him right underneath Charles II in D tier. And with that, D tier becomes two levels. Edward VIII is raised very similarly to how his father was raised, very similarly to how his grandfather was raised, in the fact that his parents didn't really pay him much attention. And by the time he is a grown adult, he is looking for love in all the wrong places. And one of the places that he looks for it is in a variety of affairs with older women. He has kind of a mommy kink, or more of a mom complex that he has to deal with. He and his mother do not get along, especially after his father's death. And one of the affairs that eventually leads to serious problems in David's life is with a woman called Wallace Simpson. Now, Wallace Simpson is a very wealthy American aristocrat who has been married twice. Wallace Warfield was originally married to Winfield Spencer. They divorced after uh, 11 years, and then she married Ernest Simpson. They were married for nine years. And finally, she is 41 years old. And she meets the 43-year-old Edward, uh, David, rather, and they fall in love. Now, at the same time, George V dies, and Edward becomes the king. Now, Edward's very popular with the people at this point because of the fact he's, he's a good-looking dude. He's very attractive to the common folk. He Think of him as kind of this Prince Harry figure, more specifically Prince Harry like 10 years ago, and everyone loves him, finds him massively attractive, but he's also the heir to the throne. So as soon as he becomes king, one thing he wants to do is marry Wallace Simpson. And Parliament says no. Now there's a variety of reasons they give to not allow Wallace Simpson to become queen. One of them is the fact that she's American and the relationship with American pol uh, with the United States politically would be disadvantaged with an American queen. Another is the fact that she is twice divorced. Now, apart from the fact that the Church of England was kind of founded on the concept of divorce, at this time, the Church of England did not have a strong opinion on, or rather, they did have a strong opinion. They did not have a very positive opinion on divorcees. The fact that both of her husbands were still alive was a huge problem, both spiritually as Edward's role as the head of the Church of England, and also the fact that these two other former husbands could be politically disadvantageous to Parliament. But the real reason, which didn't come across for several years, was the fact that the FBI and Scotland Yard had discovered that Wallace Simpson, while having her relations with Edward VIII, was also having an affair with a gentleman by the name of... Let's find him here. Uh, I believe it was 
No, it's not him. I don't know if I'm going to find it on here, actually. But she was having an affair uh, with the Nazi. To the point where she tied in Edward to become a sympathizer of Adolf Hitler. If we look up Edward VIII and Adolf Hitler, they were on very good terms, especially her, to the point where some have speculated that she may have had a serious relationship with Hitler himself. This is not a doctored photo. And actually, one of the darker tales of his relationship with Adolf Hitler and her relationship with Nazi Germany is during this visit that they made to visit Hitler, they actually toured what would go on to become a concentration camp. And this, this was not public knowledge until the early 2000s. This was not known by any means. People speculated on why the church and the government would not allow Wallace Simpson to become Queen of England but this was really the political reason. So, let's go back and find ourselves with Edward VIII. The church and the government won't allow him to marry an American. And finally, it comes to the point where he is willing to marry her, but must give up the throne. He rules as king for less than a year, is never crowned, does not have a coronation, is popular with the people, so he is acclaimed king, but abdicates on December 11th in favor of his younger brother, George VI. And all of the abdication crisis, everything to do with Edward VIII giving up power in order to marry, everything that it does to the English society as a whole and dividing people in their opinions on the royal family, devastates the royal family, and the position of the monarchy in England. And that leaves Albert Windsor to fix it. And he takes up the title George VI. His father was George V, and in order to add some kind of continuation with his father and kind of skip over his brother, he gives himself the name George VI. So where are we going to put George VI? on this list here. I think it's safe to put him top of C tier above Mary the first. Now, like I said, as soon as he took over, he was at a disadvantage. His brother was very popular. What his brother did divided people over their opinions on the royal family. It was kind of a precursor to something similar to the Charles and Diana situation that would come up 60 years later. George takes over already a very anxious, very stressed out man. He has a serious stuttering problem to the point where he is not able to speak in public without either not being able to talk or seriously embarrassing himself and the monarchy. If you're interested in seeing that played out, the King's Speech, which I believe won Best Picture in 2010, is a very good interpretation of what was going on with the abdication and George VI having to come into the role of king. He never expected to be king, and all of a sudden, he is, let's see here, 41 years old and has to take over from his brother. Now, immediately, the, there are questions of whether or not his brother is going to come back and try to overthrow his brother, whether or not his brother is going to end up having children who could play a role in succession crises. But his brother says that he will support George, Bertie, Albert, with everything that he has and will never say anything bad about the royal family and will never have children. That's what he has to promise in order to give up the throne and do what he wants and marry Wallace Simpson. So his popularity is already very low when he comes to reign. And also on top of this is the fact that as we move into World War II, he wasn't friendly with Hitler, but he was very worried about 
going on one side or another with the war. And so when Neville Chamberlain was prime minister and said that he would give areas of land to Hitler uh, in order to appease him and try to stop a global conflict, George VI, in order to promote peace, publicly supports this. And in a few years, when Hitler formally starts World War II, this backfires. People remember that George supported giving Hitler more land, and now look what's happened. This is on George. And so the people are really pissed. And what starts to turn that around is during the London bombings. When the Blitz in London happens, George and his wife Elizabeth, Elizabeth the Queen Mother, they start to use the bombing of London to their political advantage because Buckingham Palace is hit. And all of a sudden, the king and queen of the United Kingdom suddenly become just like everybody else. They aren't safe, just like everybody else. They are English, just like everybody else. They have to deal with the fallout of World War II just the same as everybody else. And then... Winston Churchill comes to power. And immediately, George VI and his wife Elizabeth become very close friends with Winston Churchill. So every political victory Winston Churchill has, George benefits from in the public eye. And then, in turn, Winston uses George as a figurehead of British pride and British culture and who they are fighting for, and he becomes a figurehead for the war effort on behalf of Winston Churchill. So when the British win World War II, not only Winston Churchill become a national hero, but now George VI becomes a national hero. But at the same time, especially with World War II, the British Empire starts to decline especially in Asia, we start to see India fall apart. In 1947, this is after World War II, India is split in half between Pakistan and India. And the British have no longer any serious influence over there. He gives up his title as Emperor of India. And all of a sudden, the empire starts to fall apart. It is replaced by the Commonwealth, which is this conglomeration of countries with him as their king, but he has no power over there, even in comparison to the little power that he has in the United Kingdom. And so the empire falls apart under his reign, and I think that's why I can't put him any higher than C tier. And this stresses him out wildly, and eventually, in 1952, at just aged 56, after years of serious stress, after taking over a stressful situation from his brother, after years of smoking and having bouts with cancer, George VI dies, and in his place is his eldest daughter, Elizabeth. And finally, we come to the last monarch that we are going to reign, or we are going to rank on this tier, because I don't think it's fair to rank Charles III's reign yet given that we are less than a year into it as of me recording this video. Where do we put Elizabeth II? I think it's safe to put Elizabeth II top of B tier. Now, a lot of people are going to want to put her higher. A lot of people are going to want me to put her lower. I think top of B tier is very safe. Now, I really genuinely liked Elizabeth II. I think her as a person... Uh, in comparison to a lot of people in political positions is something that people should strive to be like. I, I think she was very set in her faith and, and very much wanted to do the best for the people around her and the people that she ruled over. At least that is the propaganda I have been fed my entire life and have fed into. Elizabeth II is an interesting character. We see this image of grandmother figures for England throughout history, right? We see it with Elizabeth I, we see it with Queen Anne, we see it with Victoria, and then we see it with Elizabeth II, where things are going on in the country, and a lot of the times they're bad. But because of this queenly matriarch image, 
people are quick to criticize the situation, but quick to defend the queen. And that's very much the case with Elizabeth II. So Elizabeth II takes over from her father in the year 1952. If you've ever seen The Crown, The Crown is actually, especially the early seasons, very, very good at portraying Elizabeth's early reign. Um, they don't take as many liberties with the writing in the early seasons as they do with the later writing, uh, later seasons. The later seasons are still good, but if you want an actual, like, historical image of Queen Elizabeth II's reign, the crown is very good at doing that. She marries a prince from nowhere, uh, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, who was originally the prince of Greece and Denmark, if you look at his ancestry, uh, he is descended from, it doesn't go back far enough on here to show it, but uh, he is a double great grandson of Queen Victoria. He is the first co uh, first or second cousin once removed of his wife, Elizabeth II. He was the son of Prince Andrew of Denmark, who was the second son of King George I of Greece. Actually, not the second son. I think he was more towards the bottom of that line, but not the ruling, not the crown prince of Greece. He was kind of a nobody. And when Greece goes through their revolution and kicks the king off the throne, Philip flees to England. His sisters flee to Germany and they all become Nazis, which is an interesting connection to his life, which they also portray in The Crown. I really like The Crown, if that wasn't clear. But she marries Prince Philip, who is a nobody from nowhere. He doesn't become king. He becomes Prince Consort and eventually given the role of Duke of Edinburgh. She would eventually have four children. First, she has two kind of back-to-back. -back. That's Charles, who is now Charles III, and Princess Anne. And then after, I think, about a 10-year break, I'd actually have to look at the dates to double-check that, but she gives birth to uh, Jeffrey Epstein and Prince Edward. Now, her reign starts off in an interesting spot because of the fact that her father had kind of revived the monarchy. The monarchy was on shaky ground when her father took over, and all of the things that he did in his short reign helped to let that survive. It's very similar to the cases of all of the grandmotherly queens before her, right? Their reigns are great and prosperous, and a lot of what preceded them was turbulence in the monarchy. With Elizabeth, it was rooted in her uncle, Edward VIII, but was slightly saved by her father, George VI. With Victoria, things got really rocky with George III and IV, but it was kind of saved by her uncle, William IV. And same case, her father, James II, it was kind of saved by her brother-in-law and her sister. So when Elizabeth comes to the throne, the empire is falling apart. But she remains the queen of 32 different countries, the head of state of 15 realms. And one of the first things that she has to deal with is all of these countries in Africa replacing her with socialist governments. And she handles it, for the most part, very gracefully. And in some cases, actually uses her political advantage and sometimes her attractiveness as a woman to try to get some of these governments back on her side and in political advantage with Great Britain. The abdication is very influential on her upbringing. She was born with no right to the throne. She was not ever expected to be Queen of England until she was in her young adolescence and her father took over. She was very close with her father. When her father died, it kind of devastated her. And she became queen at age 26. And she ended up reigning for over 70 years, which is the longest of any monarch in English or British history. So the abdication really affects her upbringing. 
And while the empire falls apart, at the same time, the culture is modernizing. The world is getting a lot more liberal. You get the swing of the 50s, you move into the modernization of the 60s, and then you get into the 70s and the 80s, and socialism on the rise, and socialism's fall, and gay rights, and feminism, and all of these things that really start to push the bounds of British culture during her reign, and she really doesn't have anything to do with it. She is very much a figurehead queen in the same sense that Victoria was, in the same sense that Anne was. A lot of what is going on in the country during Elizabeth's reign has to do with the prime ministers under her. And she goes through a lot of prime ministers, let me tell you. So she becomes this figurehead, and while, while people, like I said, are quick to criticize the government, but somewhat quick to defend the queen, what would become kind of her defining moment happened with her son. And this is, of course, the Diana situation. So the royal family had basically given up all their power and became figureheads and celebrities. And a lot of this celebrity idea came from the brain of her husband, Prince Philip. He was very much a modernizer of the monarchy. He saw what going against the tide of culture did to his grandfather. And he wanted to modernize the monarchy. He thought it was in their best interest in order to not only continue to reign, but in order to survive with the culture to modernize. And one thing that they did to help modernize was they f kind of forced Charles, her eldest son, an heir to the throne, to not marry a woman he was in love with called Camilla. Now, that's a very complicated story in its own right and deserves to have its own video. The Crown does a good job at portraying it. Um, but Charles is in love with a woman called Camilla. And while they are in favor of modernizing and moving in a social direction that mirrors the rest of the country, this move is a little too fast for what they think is right for the, the monarchy. And they force him to give up his relationship with Camilla. And at the same time, he then falls for a woman who is very much younger than him and very much less mature than him in Princess Diana. And Princess Diana comes into the public eye not expecting to be welcomed into the family the way she is. She doesn't realize how much of a role her new position is going to be. And almost immediately, both of them regret it, not only in bringing Diana into the fold, but what their relationship is basically off the bat. Diana is very much in need of a family figure, in need of people supporting her. Charles is very different. Charles needs people who are intellectually his equals. And Prince Philip and Queen Elizabeth don't realize this until it's too late. By this point, by the time it's too late, Charles has already started having an affair with Camilla after Camilla gets divorced from her husband. Diana is having numerous affairs on the side in her tale. And both of them are using their public eye and the spectacle on them to their advantage. They really go over the top with this idea of celebrity culture. And Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip don't realize what is happening until it's too late. And eventually, Charles and Diana get divorced. And they think that this is going to solve all of their issues. And it doesn't. Public is still divided between support for the monarchy and support for Diana in her own right. And Diana tries to burn the palace to the ground as soon as she is out of it. They're already divorced, their family is already torn apart, they have already done things that are non-existent in the history of the Church of England and what the monarchy has become in the last 500 years. And Diana continues to trash the monarchy and Prince, or Prince Charles continues to not defend himself and his family the way he should and starts to make the fire worse. And this all comes to a head in 1997 when Diana is killed in a car accident in Paris. 
And the defining moment of Elizabeth's queenship is how she responds to this. And the problem is she doesn't respond. She has not responded to anything her entire reign, and this has always been typically the right thing to do. As soon as Diana dies, her not acting on it backfires. Suddenly, it becomes the subject of, of a conspiracy that Queen Elizabeth and Prince Charles conspired to have Diana killed, that Queen Elizabeth never cared for Diana, and they basically used her as a puppet to get media attention. All of these different ideas from the public come to a head with Queen Elizabeth's inability to respond. And whether or not you support Diana and her party in this situation, whether or not you su support Prince Charles and the monarchy in their situation, whether or not you think both of them are right or wrong and think that Elizabeth was doing the right thing by not acting. This has kind of been the contentious point of Elizabeth's reign. So why don't I have her higher than B tier? Obviously, she is a very successful queen in her own right. Everybody knows who she is. She was the longest reigning queen of British history. I think a lot of it has to do with her in action. And I'm not just talking about the Diana situation. I'm talking about what went on in society and politically with Britain in the 20th century. We saw the loss of the empire, the birth of the Commonwealth. We saw Britain basically go from one of the strongest countries in the world to now what is borderline not even one of the first class countries in the world. Or or I shouldn't say it's not a first world country, but it it isn't the global superpower it once was. It is it isn't even a global superpower anymore. I heard a podcast today of British people themselves talking about the fact that you know the reason people speak English as the the lingua franca in the world right now is because English was so successful for so long. The English-speaking countries were so successful for so long. And they all speculated that now that Britain is no longer the power that it used to be, maybe English is succeeded faster than we think it will. All because Britain is no longer the nation that it used to be. And Elizabeth's inaction, which some would argue, including myself, would argue that it saved the monarchy more times than it doomed it. But at the same time, her inaction has had repercussions, had serious negative repercussions for the country. I don't think anything she could have done differently would have necessarily been the better decision, but I can't put her in S tier or A tier the way that I can put someone like Elizabeth I or Victoria or Henry VIII the same way that I would put them up there because of that. So anyways, those are my thoughts on Elizabeth II. Like I said, we're not going to talk about Charles III and his reign because we, as of me recording this, are less than a year into it. But that being said, that is every king and queen of England since the Norman Conquest ranked on a tier list. And here is where we are sitting. 41 names. We go down to F tier. At the very bottom of F tier, I have... Edward II, above him Edward V, above him James II, above him William II, above him George IV, above him Henry III, above him George I. Then we move into D tier, bottom of D tier, Henry VI, moving up Richard I, Richard II, Edward VIII, Charles II, Edward VI, John, Stephen, George II, Charles I, Richard III. We move up to C tier. Henry II, George III, Henry IV, Edward VII, William IV, Mary I, George VI, Edward IV. Moving up to B tier now, we have James I, George V, Edward III, Mary II, William III, Elizabeth II. A tier, we move into the top two tiers. Bottom of A tier, I have Anne. Above her, I have Henry VII, then Henry V, then William I, William the Conqueror. And at the top of A tier, I have Edward Longshanks or Edward I. And then the four I have in S tier, Henry I, Victoria, Henry VIII, and at the very top, in my opinion, the greatest English monarch of all time, Elizabeth I. If you want to know why I have them ranked where they are, go through this video again or watch part one. That A link to that will show up at the end of this video as well. 
If you liked this video, feel free to like, share, and subscribe. It does wonders for the channel if you do all of those things or just one of those things. Feel free to comment down below if you found any nitpicks, if you disagree with my rankings, if you disagree with things I said or mistakes I made in my narration. Like I mentioned, this is the longest video project I have ever done, ever. Two back-to-back three-hour videos, and I probably have a significant amount of errors in my narration and in my presentation, but this is a start on what I would like to do with long form videos with this channel. If you like that, definitely let me know in the comment section below. If you don't like that, feel free to also let me know in the comment section below. It also does wonders for the channel. But if you want to support the channel apart from just liking and commenting and subscribing and sharing with your friends, Feel free to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash SheetG for as little as $3 a month. You can support everything we do here on SheetG, everything we do on my other channels, Echo Worm and Echo Worm Kids, where we do all things audiobook reading. Check out a link to other historical videos uh, on this channel as this video comes to a close in your bottom right-hand corner. Links to all of my other channels will be at the top. Thank you very much for being a part of this. I really do appreciate it. We will see you back here tomorrow for exploring Hogwarts Legacy. But in the meantime, hope to see you very, very soon.